In a previous video, I showed off a very mysterious computer that I'm not sure who made it, but it's very much a homemade device. But it used the RCA 1802 CPU. Uh, the more technical name for it is the Cosmac. This is one of those early microprocessors from the early 1970s, which does seem to have a fair bit of history. The history for the 1802 actually starts with a previous computer project called FRED. Um, I'm not going to recite everything that's on Wikipedia for this entire history timeline of the 1802. The reality is, in order to market a CPU successfully, you need to be able to supply for all of your vendors development tools. This can be hardware or software to help in debugging, creating compiled binaries, and large amounts of documentation. Now, Intel had their own microprocessor development systems. Motorola had theirs. RCA was no exception and had several microprocessor development systems that were available. Um, they seem to be quite few and far between. They seem to be quite rare. But by pure chance, thanks to FreeGeek never really throwing anything away, but at the same time not just selling it, so it just kind of ends up on a shelf until someone asks, you want to sell that? I do have one such device. <clears throat> ah. This here is the RCA MSE 3001. It is a full-fledged CPU emulation and program debugging suite. It is essentially a monolith of a software development kit. Now it's worth pointing out as I start this video off that there should be a front cover on this. This handle is to use, be used as a protector. We're missing something from this. We're missing the keyboard. Yep. That's happened, and this is the only living example of the MSE 3001 that I know that exists. So some schmuck found this, stole the keyboard, gave it to Free Geek, and left it for dead. I hope you're watching this. I hope you're happy. I can't use this, and neither can anybody else. The front of this thing is a little bit absurd. Look at the screen on this thing. Ignoring all the white specs, this has an absolutely horrific case of CRT cataracts. I have made a video many years ago about how to take care of this. This is fairly straightforward to the point where it's almost falling off of the tube face itself. You'll take the tube out, we'll clean it, and that'll be it. We're not going to take it out in this video, but you get the idea. There's also this piece of paper here, which is pretty much the only printed documentation that I know that exists for the MSE. And this is just a command summary, or part of the command summary. In fact, when it comes to documentation for this, the only thing I can find is a flyer, a single page flyer, which just tells the features, the functions, and the available options for this. There's nothing else. Nothing else. It's already an obscure CPU. Here's an even more obscure development system for it. Your only other controls on here are a power button, and it has an LED on the front of it, and you have a reset button. That's it. Now on the back of this machine here, we have more connections and more ports, which is down here. So, power. We have an external brake input. I don't have any documentation on what that means. We have a BP0 output. Again, no idea what that is. Probably break point. We have a C an EIA serial port. The documentation in the flyer does state that this can be used also as a terminal for the debugging environment if you have other hardware that you're working with. Cool, so it's double duty. We also have the baud rate selector for it. We have the multi-emulator coaxial port, no idea. And we have aforementioned keyboard port right there, but no keyboard, you get the idea. There is this hole here for brightness. You just kind of stick a screwdriver in there and you adjust it brightness pot on the back of the analog board. I hope there's a better way to do that. You have this trap door here, which normally holds the pod for storage. I'll show that in a moment. And then we have the badge here, which does again state RCA Microsystems MSE 3001. Your serial number is 100061. Now I doubt they made that many systems. So saying this is serial number 61, that sounds a lot more like a possibility. So this is a very early machine. Access to the various boards inside of this are through these covers here. We'll do that in a moment. 
thing slides around quite well too. So this is the pod, this box right here. You have this super long shielded ribbon cable, two of them which plug into the back of the machine. You have this box here, which is completely loaded full of RCA logic, and you have two chip sockets here that are text tool. One for an 1802, and another one here for, I'm not entirely sure. You also have these two thumbscrew terminals here. These allow you to attach a crystal, so if you're not generating the clock frequency with this device here, you're using a physical crystal to do so. But, again, this is also emulating the CPU, so I have this extra cable here which is hanging off of it. This is just a protector for the pins underneath, but you can just take your 1802 out, plug this in, do the emulation. This reminds me a heck of a lot of one of those really old fluke micro testers, which are also still very, very, very expensive. But here's your pod. This stacks away inside of here. But let's take a look inside this thing. There's a couple of cool things to show. It also comes to show just how much of a gutless wonder it can be as well. Now the first thing we have to do in order to get this thing open so we can see the analog board and the power supply is we have to remove the handle, which is these two knobs right here. They're also very long. There we go. So that comes off. This is a single piece of aluminum, by the way. This is nice. And then I have a whole bunch of screws, which I have to take out as well. I think that's all of them. And that should just pop off. Or not. There we go. Oh, I'm missing more screws. There, now. There we go, ready? This is the inside of this emulator. So here's our power supply hiding over here. It's this little modular thing. It has its outputs. It has its AC inputs. It's actually quite simple. If you ever want to replace the power supply on this, if you have one, it's just a modular drop-in. It does have a bunch of also very ancient capacitors on it. We have a beeper speaker in here as well. And this is your analog board, and this is your tube. And this is extremely clean to the point where I want to point out, like, there's almost no dust on this thing. This thing probably didn't see a whole heck of a lot of use. Is that really a surprise? It, um, yeah, uh, low serial number, and it's just clean inside. Wow, look at this thing. I do see that there are boards underneath here, and what we're going to do to get to those boards is I'm actually going to just take the back cover off, and then we're going to pull all the boards out. So pull that off to the side there. And by the way, there is a plastic cover that's right here, which means that where that little cover piece of paper card is, you have this open space here. I wonder if you could put like a floppy drive in that. I'm not entirely sure. They seem to imply that if you were going to be using any sort of floppy drive with a development system, you were using also one of their other microprocessor development systems as well. But there's a lot of empty card slots in here. I'll show you. Also, it's worth pointing out, there's this giant caution on the back here. For the purpose of shipment only, the personality board is stowed in the slot next to the bottom so slot of the card guide housing. Prior to operation, transfer this board to the top slot of the housing and exit the header pod cables through the slot provided in the rear access panel. They're referring to this hole right here. I am actually missing two screws on this, so someone's definitely been in here, but how nice of them to at least leave that piece of paper there as well. Three screws, the cover comes off, and here are your personality boards. So the first one I'm gonna take out of here, if I can, I'm just gonna pull on that, now out comes this monolith of a board, and now I'm going to zoom in. So the pod plugs into these two headers right here. Um, almost every IC on this thing is RCA. So CDP1872CE, I believe that's actually RAM. Um, all of these are Hitachi ROMs. There's a bunch of EPROMs on here. 
Do I know what their conditions are? Absolutely not right now. Uh, what do they call them? HN 462732G. So these are just 2732 EEPROMs. Okay, that's actually fairly straightforward. Maybe I should dump those before it's too late. So that was living in the top slot. Other than that, you can see there's obviously space here for more ROMs and a few more ICs, but all of that is completely unpopulated. In fact, over here, it's just barren land. There's nothing over here at all. But you can see the interface for the pod. Neat stuff. So that there was in the top slot. I'm just gonna push that back in and doesn't want to seat properly. It's probably putting up a fight because it's almost never been pulled out of here. Uh, we have two empty slots below that. Now, I don't know what could be in there. Maybe more RAM, maybe communications options, maybe that disk controller for this aforementioned weird slot or opening I have in here as well. But the next board in here is RAM. This is full of NEC. What are you? NEC A2234Y-218D444C. Um, off the top of my head, I don't remember what kind of RAM that is. So text box, please. Okay, so this is only half populated with RAM, so you could obviously add more. Um, there's the same thing, unpopulated pin, uh, chip spots all over the place here. So this is a RAM board. Actually, does it describe what it is? 64K RAM. Says right there. So I'm assuming, hmm, okay, so that gives us the possibility this is, the masking here is for a full 64K if populated, and this is currently 32K, or this particular version of it, I don't know why you do this, is 64K, and if you wanted 128K, you just populated this side here. Not really sure. Again, very clean board layout. Looks really good. This last one here, however, is the system board. For me to take that out first, I have to keep the RAM board out and I have to unplug a connector here. Then there's two more screws that I have to take out and then that board will slot out as well. Okay, so I just pull on that, there we go. And we have yet more EEPROMs, and this one here doesn't even state what it is, does it? Sure doesn't. Anyways, so you have your ROM here. I'm guaranteeing you now that's RAM that's hiding there. Uh, where is our CPU? So we have CDP 1805. CDP 1869, CDP 1854, and what are you? 91048, TAI 0733. I have a feeling since the RAM is here, the ROM is here, this is going to be a variant of the, eight, of the 1802 sitting right here. But this is the main system board. Uh, that header that I unplugged is right here. This is the video output that goes up to the top of the analog board here, so all the video signals go through here. Uh, serial port is probably controlled by one of these. I'm assuming that the keyboard port is... What are you? You're a CDP1855. I think that's a multi-port I.O. chip from RCA. I'd have to double check on that. So here we are all reassembled again. Now. It was only three boards, and it's a fairly large enclosure, which is odd, so there's a lot of expandability. Though without a keyboard attached, I do wonder how much of this actually works. Well, the answer is... Other than displaying a brief blip there on that green phosphor screen as we turned it off, um, it just emits a, emits a long beep. Um, this could be a hardware issue, this could be a power supply issue that I'm not aware of, I have checked the rails, there's not a lot of ripple, and all the voltages seem with intolerance. This could be some other failure, it could still very well be the EEPROMs, which would be very unfortunate because there's no other copies of them around. Um, but really, without any other documentation, what am I to do? But this is just one idea of what was being done to develop for the 1802. 
The MSE 3001 also, like I said, wasn't the only product available out there. Every other semiconductor company was doing their own thing as well. What I have right here is Intel's single board computer 80, 8005, sorry. Um, this is, what was it, an 8085 single board computer? And it has everything you would need to do development on it or to just use it as is. ROM, CPU, a little bit of RAM, your choice of RS-232 or 20 milliamp current loop, and it uses Intel's multibus interface. Was it Intel that was patenting multibus? Anyways, it uses multibus. Intel also had a very large product line of devices that could be used either for debugging, development, or use. This is the ICE-49. This is an MCS-48 in-circuit emulator. This could be very similar to what the MSE would have been using simply because this here, the 1802, was used in Chrysler's Lean Burn computer. The MCS-48 was used in AMC and Ford computers at the same time. So, kind of a neat little bridge over there. Intel provided all sorts of other items such as disk-based interpreters and operating systems for their systems, enclosures, and of course they had a variety of boards, documentation, relays, expansion. You could order it all through one of Intel's many catalogs. This is their 1980 systems data catalog. Otherwise, that's all I can really say about this. It's really cool. Without a keyboard, it's kind of useless. And I don't have much else of a way to troubleshoot it or test it. Um, if you have a keyboard for one of these and you'd like to have, give it to me or like break some sort of a deal so I could have a complete system, I do want to talk to you. If you remember using one of these or you have more information about these, uh, leave a comment down below or drop me an email. But until next time, have a good one.